makes each of us unique, different from each other. Isn't it the milestones in life that we step into? Each milestone, you know, the padav of life, where we are at a crossroads, and we have to take strong decisions. It brings about a change in our life, and our actions then define the course of our life, our destiny. They shape us into who we are and who we can become. <laughs> and I think it is those milestones where there's a voice that we hear, a voice that echoes from within us, that sometimes screams, sometimes pleads, asks us, asks the universe, what now? That's the theme of today, right? <laughs> so, all right, so today I'm going to talk about the four milestones of my life, which have shaped me into becoming who I am and um, what I am becoming. So, let's start. So, as a 10-year-old, I was an overtly emotional child. And um, do you all know that I'm from a village in Rajasthan, a very remote village? I am, very proudly. So, as a 10-year-old, I was very, very emotional, desi village girl, climbing trees, uh, running around the old forts of Rajasthan, uh, you know, my village. And I was a doting as in crazy about my parents' daughter. Now, I know everyone loves their parents, but in my case, you know, it was like I was living for them from the time that I can remember. I was born to impress my parents. I just wanted to do anything to make them happy. And why not? You know, my father rose from a very remote village called Mandhan uh, in Rajasthan, and he became a celebrated CRPF encounter specialist officer, all on his own. My mother, very beautiful Bengali woman, strong, opinionated, dominated, uh, dominating. <laughs> dominating, adamant, actually, uh, to quite a limit. And I was very impressed. I used to just try to, you know, uh, copy them, be like them. Uh, all that was fine, but the thing that had a very strong impression on me growing up was the yearly transfers that my father had. Because, you know, when you're in the IPS or IAS, uh, it's very uh, often that you're, you know, changing posts every two years or something, and that made me very unhappy. Because, uh, like I said, I was very emotional. I used to get attached to things, people, schools, friends, surroundings very easily. So changing schools, changing friends year after year made me not just unhappy and confused, but also, you know, pushed me back academically because there were times when uh, midterm I would have to change schools and Different school, different syllabus. It was all confusing for me, and because of that, my mother thought that it's important that we put her in a hostel. Now, this decade that I was in the hostel uh, was a miserable one, because I was a village girl, very desi, with a strong desi accent. Uh, school was very very uh, English, Englishified, very English influenced, uh, with like a very different culture, you know, although it was in India, but we were forced to speak in English, we were forced to be in a certain way, and if you're not, you're made fun of. So I was made fun of all the time in my school because I was tall, thin, lanky, you know, I had a name, <laughs> which I still remember, Lanky Doodle, everyone used to call me Lanky Doodle, and each time I would pass the corridors, I would hear Lanky Doodle. I would just want to hide somewhere, I would want the day to end, and I would get into my bed and I would cry. I didn't know bullying and ragging existed, you know, in such early uh, days of school. But I was ragged, I was bullied, and I was a cop's daughter, but nobody gave a damn about that in, you know, the school hostel. I used to write letters in blood. I used to tell my parents to, you know, take me back. I used to cry. I was miserable. And I was lagging even more behind in studies because I had no concentration. I would open my books and I, I, could, I couldn't read anything because there would be tears in my eyes constantly. I would tell them that I will Hindi medium. I will first I will And every morning I would stand 
at my school hostel gate, looking at the steps, you know, coming up, going down, and I would imagine my father coming up those steps to take me back, but he wouldn't. And I would just stand there thinking, what's going to happen? How am I going to continuously live here year after year? What now? All right. At 20, I had somehow, you know, completed my school and it was time for college and I was glad that I'm out of the hostel and everything. And um, we came to Delhi. And I wanted to finally now go to a co-ed because all my schooling was girls and I wanted to, you know, like live and see what actually life is all about. But again, my mother, she said no. Uh, Girls College mein jana hai. I think uh, she saw some horns on me somewhere and she didn't really trust me <laughs> with, you know, going to a co-ed. And uh, I don't know if you guys know about the difference between North Campus Delhi and South Campus Delhi. South Campus is like really cool and, you know, yeah. And, you know, back then, 20 years back, it was more of uh, all these courses like mass communication and all were, you know, brimming there. So I wanted to go to the South Campus. But my mother forcefully made me go to Indraprastha College for women and uh, I had to take philosophy honors because that was the only course I was getting through with my cutout. I hated it yet again. I hated it and I was like, why is it that Plato is saying this and why do I have to understand what Charvak is saying and Vedanta philosophy, why, how is this going to help me get a job? So, I didn't know what to do, but I wanted to do uh, several other things. Okay, don't think that I was like a you know, really bad kid at studies. Yeah, I was very hyper. I had a lot of energy, which was going haywire. But yeah, maybe I didn't have the patience to sit with a book and study, but I was very energetic. I used to love to do different plays, become a character, uh, become different characters in one play, you know, and I would decorate the auditorium with flowers and rangoli for uh, before a function within a few hours. So those were my talents, but you know, 20 years back, singing, dancing, rangoli banana, and yes, art karna was not considered uh, very bright qualities of a child. Maths me kitne number aaye hain? Bhugol ka pata hai ki nahi? All that was considered that yes, yes, yes. I mean, if you general knowledge, if you ask any question, you have to answer it with a quick answer. So, this was the whole vibe. So, uh, <coughs> um, yeah. So, I did my college. And uh, while doing college, I also started modeling and uh, giving like different entrance exams, trying to figure out what I am all about and what my talents are. You know, the whole lanky doodle concept, tall, thin, as well as I didn't eat any food, works great on the ramp. Yes, so I got lots of... <laughs> thank you. So I got lots of modeling assignments, and uh, thanks to the hostel ka Englishifying the Desi girl, my English became better than what it was, and uh, I auditioned for some anchor-based shows, and a talent hunt team came to my college and selected me for... Uh, uh, DD Metro's anchor-based few shows that I started doing and started coming on TV. I remember it was my third year of uh, philosophy honors exam. I was sitting and giving my exam. My teacher came and she said, Tumko! Tumko I saw TV on TV. When did you study? You will fail this year. You will fail this year. I am writing and you will fail. I didn't fail. <laughs> I passed. <laughs> I got second division, but so did the rest of the class that wasn't on TV. <laughs> <laughs> And then one fine day, just like that, I got a call from Balaji Telefilms. I had auditioned for Ekta's talent hunt team in Delhi, and I just auditioned and forgot about it. And I got a call from um, Ekta's right hand telling me that ma'am has really liked your audition, and we would like you to come and do play the negative lead in one of our K-serials. Whoa! Mumbai! Gaon ki ladki! And uh, now what to do? Shall I um, keep doing what I'm doing? Shall I become a director? Because, you know, I wanted to tell stories. I wanted to capture beautiful frames and show the world. So do all of that or shall I go to Mumbai and, you know, do this? But then I thought, why not? 
I've anyway lived in a hostel. That's anyway taught me how to fight a pack of wolves who are coming to bully me and rag me for no fault of my own. And um, it's made me independent. It's made me live without my parents that I love so much. So why not? What now? This now. So I did that. But you know, in life, whenever we're doing something, whenever we get something, it always comes with a price. There's always a sacrifice involved. Now, you got the screenplay, I don't know what kick he gets in it, but uh, he or she, uh, feminists shouldn't get angry that there is a God is woman. Uh, <laughs> so the day that I was sitting in the train coming to Mumbai um, was also the day that I had to appear for my final round of IPS because I'd cleared the entrance. But I chose to do this and um, came to Mumbai. Now the decade that started in my 20s was the most fascinating. It was something that I had not dreamt. I did not really have uh, these wonderful dreams that most of these lovely speakers are talking about because um, all my dreams and all my decisions were usually taken you know, by my mom. So I had not really dreamt of it, but I worked hard. I hadn't come to Mumbai to make a career. No, I hadn't. I hadn't come to Mumbai to become a film heroine, become famous. No. I had come to Mumbai to create a life that I don't get uprooted from. I had come to Mumbai to, you know, create a life where my decisions are my own, my mistakes are my own. Okay, bad kiya, to theke, bad kiya, I'll rectify it. But I kiya. And um, I worked really hard. I worked day and night. I accepted any cereal that Ekta offered me. I was blessed that I got that opportunity. And I did different shows after shows and characters after characters. And I put my 100% into it. And Mumbai gave me what no other city, no other place uh, gave me. Loved me like a mother. Mumbai gave me the safety that I didn't have in Delhi, you know, every day from uh, Ghaziabad, that's where we used to live. Going to IP college, was an adventure. Matlab Sindhbad ko itna adventure nahi ho, hota hoga, jitna ladkiyon ko hota hai. And wo time pe, when there were no cabs, no taxis, you know, teen teen sharing wale auto mein, auto mein koi apni murgiyan leke bhi chad raha hai, to koi aisa cut leke, uske khanjar bhi hai, wo bhi baith raha hai. So, itne sharing wale auto mein bhi hum border tak jate the. So that, I mean, from that to this, and not just this, you know, the hard work and everything really paid off. The whole Desi accent that I was so, Embarrassed about Desi accent. I mean, I did it all in FIR. I took out everything that I'd seen in my childhood, all the North Indian dialects, all the different cities my dad was posted in, all the small towns that I'd lived in, all those quirkiness, all every the you know the accent, dialects, everything I put into my work, my show FIR. And what now? I was a different person, I was celebrated, it was all great. And then one day, you know, I was wearing my uniform, I remember, it was an extravagant scene we were shooting, and I got a call from my father's doctor, telling me that my father has cancer. Multiple myeloma originated from the uh, bone marrow and spreads into the blood, hits all the organs of the body, and it was an advanced stage. And he was telling me that we don't, I don't think we have more than six months to a year uh, with the treatment. I'm just, so he was telling me all this, and I was, you know, frozen listening uh, to the line of treatment that we are going to follow after this. And uh, as I cut the phone, I got up and I told my crew, Chalo, karte hai shooting. Everyone had more fear in their eyes than me. Like everyone was asking me, what now? Thereafter, the time that I lived was a crazy one. Because I uh, thought, Are, aise kaise? you know, I am going to do this. I have become someone. Aise kaise my father is going to go. I am not going to let him go. I traveled. I got him Tibetan medicines. Of course, his chemo and radiation was going on here. I. Um, we tried Tibetan medicines, we tried Ayurvedic medicines too, uh, which I believe gave him six months to a year more of his life. But on um, 30th July 2016, he breathed his last. And while I was, you know, shaking his ice cold body, telling him to wake up, I just screamed to myself, what now, without anybody else hearing it, but what now? <sighs> 
I lost my will to achieve. I became so angry, so frustrated. I didn't want to work. I didn't. I said no to every work offer that came my way because I was like, "Kiske liye karna hai?" When that man, you know, when why to run a race when on the finish line my father is not there clapping for me? Why to do it? For whom? For what? And it just made me an unhappy, depressed, and angry person who snapped at every equation that I had. Anyway, I didn't know how to run a relationship for more than one or two years, whether it's you know friendship or anything else, because I'd not learned to be with anybody for more than one or two years. You know, um, so I was totally going crazy, getting angrier and angrier, which was actually a cry for help. and then i believe um, you know miracles work in the most simplest ways they look really simple but they they are miraculous when uh, you realize what they are and i also believe that sometimes you know you can't do something when you're alive you do it after once you're gone and soon after my father left i realized the clutter that i had gathered around me the wrong friends that had gathered around me who were just with me because of the fame and the parties and the lifestyle and i wasn't enjoying it anymore i started traveling more i started traveling to the mountains and that's when i discovered yoga yog i discovered vedant and i started studying philosophy i started reading the bhagavad gita and i realized that the things that i used to just learn in college because i had to pass they were looking up to me they were talking to me they were resonating with me all the philosophical lessons the conversations they were telling me how to fix myself how to heal myself how to unlearn the wrong that i had learned for so long and become a new person reinvent and learn better things so i stand here today far from perfect in fact heavily flawed stumbling falling each day but getting up with immense gratitude for this life full of ups and downs failures and success victories and defeats fame and embarrassment peace and unrest everything every mistake that teaches me till today to work on them and become better than what i was yesterday I have gratitude in realizing that everything that happened in my life, my school, uh, my college, every little thing has given me a chance to carve myself. I'm not saying I'm very well carved, but I'm just saying that I make a promise to myself that I'll never drop the chisel down till i breathe my last i'll keep carving on myself i'll keep reinventing i'll keep falling i'll keep getting up i promise never to hold anybody else responsible for my bad and take the responsibility of all the wrong with the right in my life and most importantly i promise to not be fearful of that voice that echoes periodically but embrace it each time it echoes from within me saying what now